All right, turn to the little letter of Philemon with me, please. It's a great little letter. It's the warmest personal letter that we have on record Paul ever writing. Philemon. It's, uh, do you know what his name means? I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, it comes from the Greek word phileo, which means to love, uh, an affection, a friendly kind of love. Literally, his name means one who kisses. So it's, uh, he's, he, he, I don't know what his character is, but uh, his name is a picture of real friendly affection. Paul led this man to the Lord. Uh, he tells us that in the 19th verse. Uh, we get that uh, clear implication where he said, uh, you owe me even your own self besides. And reading between the lines, what he means by that is, hey, <laughs> you're a believer because I preached the gospel and uh, you heard and received the message and, and uh, came to Christ. He lives in the city of Colossae, which is, I think, important that we look at this little letter simply because we're studying the book of Colossians each Sunday morning. So he lives in the city of Colossae, and the church of Colossae was headquartered in his house. He must have been wealthy. Uh, he had a large uh, house, and the church met in his house. We are told, as Paul greets him in verse 2, he not only greets Philemon in the first verse, but in verse 2, Athea and Archippus, which we're not sure, but again, the implication is that Athea is his wife and Archippus is his son. And uh, in Philippians, uh, rather Colossians 4.17, Paul uh, exhorts uh, Archippus to make full proof of his ministry. Some believe that Philemon's son, Archippus, was the pastor of the church there in Colossae, and that very well may be, but we don't know for sure. What is uh, interesting is that Paul never visited Colossae, but he was acquainted with the church which met in Philemon's house. Paul wrote this when he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians as well. During his first imprisonment in Rome, when he was under house arrest. And uh, so he wrote this, and he was, of course, under arrest, not because he was a criminal, but because he preached the gospel and they didn't like it. And so he tells us in verse 9 uh, that uh, he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He makes that very clear. And thus he sends this very warm personal letter to Philemon. But why? What's he writing? Is he just being friendly with him? No. You know the story behind it? Maybe we should read the story. Let's take some time and read the story. Um, <clears throat> let's do this. Got it, uh, Philemon? Yes. It's only one chapter, 25 verses. Uh, and I already talked about uh, who it's addressed to. The church in your house, he says in verse 2. Grace to you, peace, verse 3. From God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the vows of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, we're saying, though I might be bold in Christ to enjoin you, which is convenient. What's he saying there? He's saying what what's proper, what's required, I could require it of you. Uh, I have the authority as an apostle to command this. But instead, he says, for love's sake, verse 9, I rather beseech you, I beg you, <laughs> being such a one as Paul the aged and now a prisoner, you know, considering I'm an elderly man, and uh, I'm a prisoner for Jesus. I beg you, I beseech you, verse 10, 
for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He means not his biological son, of course, but his spiritual son that he said was born again as a result of Paul's ministry while he's in prison, while he's under arrest. How uh, this man Onesimus was saved because of Paul's witness, verse 11, which in time past, meaning Onesimus, was in time past to you, Philemon, unprofitable. But now he's profitable to you and me. Verse 12, whom I have sent again, and therefore receive him, that is my own vows, my own heart, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. What he's saying is, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. This man that was unprofitable to you. Well, when you read the whole story and again, see all the implications, what you recognize is this was a day when slavery was acceptable. We, we read that in the Roman Empire, there were 60 million slaves. That's a lot over the empire. And Onesimus was a slave, and Philemon was his master. And uh, Onesimus probably stole something from Philemon and then fled and ran away. And so he runs and he meets Paul. Paul leads him to the Lord. He's born again, this runaway slave. And so now Paul is going to bat for him, so to speak. Paul is trying to reconcile this broken relationship between Philemon, the master, and Onesimus, the runaway slave. And so he continues uh, in verse 14. I could command this of you, but uh, uh, I could keep him here, but I wouldn't do that without your permission. Without your mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity. But I want you to, will. if you want him to stay with me and minister to me, I want it to be something that you willingly do, and I don't want to force the issue. Fifteen, for perhaps he, Onesimus, therefore, departed for a little while, a season, that you should receive him forever. Maybe he, he ran away as a thief from you, did you wrong, and ran away for a little uh, spell. But now that he's saved, uh, you should take him back permanently. Verse 16, not now as a, as a slave, but above a slave, a brother, beloved, a beloved brother in the Lord, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If you count me, therefore, a partner, then receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you, verse 18, of course he did, or owes you anything, of course he did, then charge it to me. Charge it to my, put it on my bill. Charge it to my account. Put it on my account. I have written it with my own hand and I will repay it. Although, albeit, I don't say to thee how much you owe me, <laughs> even your own self. In other words, yeah, I'll pay it back. I'll pay whatever he stole. I'll make it good for him. But I'm not going to say how much you owe me, even your own, your own self, your own soul, because you were born again as a result of my ministry. So, verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my heart, my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto you, knowing that you do more than I say. You go the extra mile regarding Onesimus, our mutual brother. You'll do more than I say, but with all, prepare also a lodging for me, for I trust that through your prayers I'm going to be set free. I shall be given unto you. So salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ. Epaphras, you remember, was from the Philippian church. He's named in, in uh, the book of Philippians, Epaphroditus. This is his nickname, Epaphras, here in that verse. 
Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, remember him? Demas later on forsook the Lord because he loved the world. That's why Jesus, uh, That's why we're warned, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, right? Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, Dr. Luke, the beloved physician. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. By the way, Marcus is probably John Mark who wrote the gospel who Paul uh, would not uh, work with, but Barnabas took him because he was Barnabas's cousin. Uh, interesting. Little letter, isn't it? Let's have a word of prayer. And then let's talk from this passage about restoring broken relationships. You all have them, right? <laughs> There's some people that uh, you don't have a good relationship with. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I ask that you might just use this little letter from the, the ancient city of, of Colossae and uh, this incident and circumstance to just teach our own hearts. Lord, Breathe on us, we pray, as we've sung. Breathe on us afresh. Your life rejuvenate, revive, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Philippians, or, or rather Philemon, is uh, a story of restoring broken relationships. That's how I look at it. And I, wanted to, I, I, I see three steps in this. And the first step in restoring broken relationships is what we would call salvation. Isn't it amazing how God works? I mean, we don't understand everything that we just read, but we get enough of it. That it's just amazing how God works. First of all, he works in salvation. He saves this thief. He saves this, uh, this runaway slave. Salvation. And now this is going to seem obvious to you, I understand. But I think we need to be reminded salvation is supernatural. Salvation is, I think, the greatest miracle that God works. I think that salvation is a spiritual miracle that is greater than any physical miracle. Salvation is a total divine work from start to finish. But it requires human cooperation. Not human work, but human cooperation. No one is saved against their will. It always comes down to a personal choice. But it's amazing how that choice comes about. God will never force a person against their will, but boy, does he know how to apply pressure at just the right time, in just the right amount, in just the right ways, right? Salvation. Think about what it took for you to get saved. Think about how God worked in your life. Now, some have more dramatic salvation experiences than others, but often it came down to a point where you finally recognized your need, and often we don't recognize our need until we're, we're, we're beat down, you know, until we're broken, until we're brought to a place where we say, whoa, I, I, I can't handle this. Which leads me to say something else about salvation. Not only is it supernatural, but wouldn't you agree that salvation also involves the fact that it's providential? It's providential. What I mean by that, providence is it's God is always at work. And a lot of the times his, his working isn't, uh, isn't seen by us, isn't noticed by us. Sometimes it's deliberately invisible. Other times it's obvious, but we don't get it. We don't see it until after the fact. But salvation is a supernatural act of God. But salvation is also, it's something that is providential. Onesimus robbed Philemon. He ran away to Rome. I'm sure his intention was, I'll get lost in the crowd. I'll, I'll get lost in the crowd. I'll be able to hide from my master or anyone else that is looking for me in this large city, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it somehow. But providentially, God brought him smack dab in contact with Paul, a friend of his master, Philemon, and also an apostle. 
a preacher of the gospel. And of course, as a result of that contact, providentially that God arranged it, he gets saved. He's led to the Savior. Now, this just isn't circumstance, or as they say, happenstance. This just isn't coincidence that this man comes in contact with Paul the Apostle when he's trying to run away from it all, when he's trying to hide from it all, when he's trying to avoid it all. He's led right. You know what this tells me? Have you ever heard of the poem, The Hound of Heaven? <laughs> It's a poem about the Holy Spirit. He's likened to a dog that tracks its prey. He's the hound of heaven. He's on your track. The Holy Spirit of God is trailing people. And he uses, providentially, he, or, he, he, he turns and organizes circumstances to bring about his will, to get his work done. So the, the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit, is he is pursuing Onesimus. He's on his heels. He's following him. And little does Onesimus know, he's not only following him, but the Holy Spirit is leading him. He's lost, but he is being led into the path of the great apostle Paul. And it's a crisis moment in this man Onesimus' life. And God uses crises, God uses times of crises to humble us, as I said a moment ago, to cause us to, he, he reveals our need and then we see it. He brings us to the place where we're like in checkmate and we have no other moves. We have no other answer. There is no other alternative. And God, at that point, has us just where he wants us. Some people, when they get to that point, commit suicide. Think that that's the way out. But it's not, obviously. But this is where restoring broken relationships begins. It begins with salvation. <clears throat> it begins either with one or the other person coming to the Lord. In the Christian life, one of the two in this broken relationship comes to salvation, becomes a believer through the supernatural and providential work of God. But there's a second thing that I see here about restoring broken relationships. Not only does it re, uh, require salvation, but it also includes reconciliation. Reconciliation. You know what it, that word means? To uh, reconcile means to change from one condition to another. And when we're talking about broken relationships, it means to bring peace between two warring factions or two people that aren't getting along. To bring, to reconcile them is to bring a change in that broken relationship and to bring them together. Now, there are two kinds of reconciliation that I want to suggest to you that, uh, again, are implied here and yet not uh, necessarily sta uh, stated. And the first, this is important for you to understand. If you want to restore a broken relationship with anyone, you have to understand these two uh these two types of reconciliation. They're not the same, but they're related. The first type is what I call attitudinal reconciliation. Attitudinal reconciliation is that you as a saved person, you as a recipient of this supernatural providential salvation, that you come to a place where you forgive that individual or those individuals, that you forgive them unconditionally in your heart before the Lord, that you empty yourself of bitterness toward them and release them to God and let him deal with them as he will, okay? Attitudinal forgiveness or, or reconciliation, I'm saying. 
You know what this is about? To have this kind of an attitude where you can forgive people, not be bitter against them, and release them to God, trust God to deal with them and work it out. That means that you have come to a place in your thinking, in your mind, in your heart, where you find your security in the Lord, where you find ide your identity in him and in nothing else, in not having it your way, in not uh, being anything but a child of God. You find your security and identity in the Lord and not in anyone or anything else. And by the way, that's true of you. If you're a believer, remember, we'll get to it. In Colossians 3 and verse 4, Christ, who is your life? If Christ is your life, then guess what? You're totally secure. And if Christ is your life, and he is if you're a believer, that's who you are. That's your identity. And so that security and identity that you have in Christ is so basic to being able to forgive anyone unconditionally in your heart and empty yourself of bitterness and release them to God because you have your security and identity of who you are in Christ. You don't have to prove that you're some macho Brooklynite. <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, I had a roommate, and he did. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he really meant it, but he had this saying, you know, I'll get you back uh, forever. You know, it's like, I'll never forgive you. You know, that's not, that's not. Bible. That's not Christian. Christians don't retaliate. Christians don't seek revenge. They trust the Lord to do whatever he sees fit. I would say also in, in response to that, if you really forgive someone from your, if you forgive unconditionally in your heart before God, it, this has nothing to do with you going to them. This adnitudinal reconciliation has nothing to do with you meeting with them. Is that clear? It's a meeting between you and God where you empty your heart of all bitterness before the Lord and before the Lord have forgive them unconditionally and then release them in your relationship with the Lord and release them totally to him. Okay? That's adnitudinal forgiveness. And the, I would add to that what Paul says in, in uh, Romans 12. Ask the Lord to show you how you might do them some good, some area where you can do them good. Uh, I don't know what that might be. It obviously would include praying for them because we're to pray for our enemies, right? But maybe some actual physical material good that you can do to them. Adnitunal reconciliation. But the second part, the second kind of reconciliation that I want to talk about is what I call relational relational reconciliation. And this involves you and the offender. Attitudinal is you and God, but relational is you and the offender. If the offender responds to your forgiveness, repents by confessing, and is willing to make restitution for whatever they have done, in order to be reconciled, then that is relational reconciliation. But they need to be willing to make They need to be able to be willing to make restitution. For instance, Onesimus, in order to be reconciled to Philemon, he had to pay off the debt of whatever he took from his master. Whatever he took from Philemon, he had to make that right. Uh, obviously, in verses 18 and 19 of the, this little letter, Paul offers to repay. He says, put that on, on, charge that to my account, put it on my account. But he's calling Philemon to graciously forgive. There's that attitudinal forgiveness. And then Onesimus to make the restitution that is needed. And, if, and, and Paul even uh, says, I'll do it myself. There's another man in Colossians in the last uh, chapter. His name is uh, Tychicus. He carried the letter that Paul wrote to the, the church at Colossae. 
where Philemon lived and the house, uh, the church was in his house. And Onesimus traveled with Tychicus uh, back to Colossae from Rome. And I think that it was on, on, Onesimus that brought the letter to Philemon there in Colossae. And uh, so he brought that book with him. But he says in this, uh, in this little letter that he calls Onesimus no longer a mere slave, but now a brother, a brother in the Lord to Philemon. That is, that is attitudinal. And with this, re this restitution, it is relational uh, reconciliation going on here. The appeal to Philemon on the behalf of Onesimus is just full of gracious words. I think the only way to ever reconcile is that one person in the in the picture is knows the power of salvation. And one evidence of being saved is you want to get right with people. You want relationships to your store. You want to you don't want to go around with a grudge in your heart toward people. You don't want to uh, have bitterness develop in your heart toward others. And so that's one uh, real evidence of salvation, that desire to be reconciled and being willing to make any restitution necessary in order for that, that uh, reconciliation to take place. You seek to repair relationships. Husbands, wives, children, kids, parents. Saved people seek to repair broken relationships. They're unwilling to live in that condition. Now, I know what it's like to live in a broken relationship, but I don't live in them long because I can't stand it. I can't stand living in broken relationships that I can't repair. And if, But if I can't repair them, I can't repair them. You know... It's a necessary part of being right with the Lord that you seek to reconcile to people in relationships that are damaged. You seek to. That doesn't mean you always can. Sometimes the person's dead and you can't get it right with them. Or sometimes you can't find them, so you can't get it right with them. But if at all you do everything you can to seek to repair a broken relationship, and as much as possible, even if it's just attitudinal and not relational, as much as possible, reconcile with people that you have a broken relationship with. Because listen, if you don't seek to do that, you're not right with God. You're not right with God. In fact, you can't honestly worship the Lord if you haven't sought reconciliation with a person that you know there is a broken relationship with that person. Leave your gift to the all at the altar, go and be reconciled with that person, and then come and worship, you might say, offer your gift. So you can't be right with the Lord uh, if you haven't sought, at least sought, at, at least done the first part of reconciliation and attitudinal where you have unconditionally forgiven and you're not bitter against them. Christians are all God's Onesimuses <laughs> when you think of it. We are all God's Onesimuses and we have a relationship with, with the Father through Jesus and it's a relationship that is thoroughly one of grace. We didn't deserve it. But he, like Paul, stood in our behalf and reconciled us by his death. Again, Colossians tells us by his death on that cross and his shed blood. So there's a third part to broken relationships that I want to talk about. Not only salvation and reconciliation, but thirdly, transformation. Because that's what's happened. That's what happens when reconciliation is made. Lives and relationships through salvation, they're reconciled. And then those lives and those relationships undergo transformation. And it makes otherwise useless lives useful 
lives. This name Ones uh, Onesimus literally means useful. He stayed with Paul. He was forming a close friendship with Paul. And as a result, this guy that was a thief and a runaway, that did his, his, uh, his master wrong, this guy becomes useful. Look at what Paul says in verse 11. In time past, he was unprofitable to you. Yeah, he ripped you off and then ran away. But now he's profitable to you and to me. You see what happens here? Salvation is the start of it. And reconciliation carries it forward. And it ends in a total transformation. From uselessness to usefulness. He's now useful. And not only that, he's also equal. This slave is now equal with Philemon. He convinces the church where slavery was part of the culture to accept and to embrace biblical truth that everyone is equal in Christ. Doesn't matter what your status is socially. We're all equal in Christ. And again, that brings me, that reminds me of Colossians. We're, we'll get here eventually. In chapter 3, uh, he says, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, that slave, nor free. But Christ is all and in all. When Christ is in you, when Christ is in us all, then Christ is all there is. And that equals, that, that, uh, that equalizes the ground. And so the transformation of this, uh, of this relationship of a master-slave, that still exists. Onesimus is still Philemon's slave. That's the culture. But they're on equal footing spiritually, and there is different treatment as a result of that. He is now not only a slave, but he is a brother uh, before the Lord. That heart acceptance is so necessary that mercy has to trump, if you will, justice. And that's what is being asked here by Paul of Philemon. There is now a new basis for. Philemon and Onesimus to have a relationship from a social status to a spiritual family now that Onesimus is a part of. And it's so wonderful because the gospel and salvation erases discrimination. It erases those, uh, those boundaries and we become one in Christ. So there's a transformation. This guy now is useful. He is also equal spiritually, but also I want you to see something else about this transformation is something that happens to an individual. It is personal. God changes a person's attitude from a bitter attitude, a resentful and hateful slave to now becoming a willing, submissive servant. I came across this. Here is a letter that was written about 50 years after this little letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. And it's written by a man by the name of Ignatius. He was a pastor in the city of Antioch. And he was being taken by uh, Roman soldiers to Rome in order to be executed. And on the way, they stopped over in the uh, city of Smyrna, and he wrote to the church at Ephesus. Ignatius wrote to the church of es Ephesus, and he commended the, the pastor Onesimus. <laughs> now, we have no way of knowing if it's the Onesimus here in the, uh, the book of Philemon, but it very well could be that this uh, this former slave actually becomes a pastor 
in that city of Colossae. Maybe he followed Archippus after that. I don't know, but I thought that was an interesting thought. Anyway, I heard the story of two brothers that were convicted years ago of stealing sheep. And as a result, their punishment was that they would were branded on their foreheads, ST, sheep stealers, or, or uh, sheep thief. Well, one brother, he couldn't stand the stigma of having that brand on his forehead. And so he moved away and never returned. But the other brother, he chose a different course. He said, you know, I can't run from what I did. I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to earn the respect of my neighbors. And as the years passed, he really did build a reputation of integrity. And one day, someone new came through the town, a foreigner, and they noticed the, the letter still on his forehead. And they asked someone else in the town what that signified. And the guy said, I'm not sure. It happened a long time ago. I, I forget the specifics. But I think the letters stand for Saint, S-T. <laughs> You know, although there's no mention in the story that the cause of the thief's transformation was he was saved, it illustrates what the gospel does, in fact, in everyone that it saves. Just as Paul said, if any person is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And from sheep thief, you become saint. 